Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Uh, Before we bring our guest in for today's uh, adult slash teenage improver interview, I did just want to talk for a second about what's going on in the world. We're recording here on June 3rd, 2020. And obviously here in the United States, there's been protests every night and unfortunately some um, property damage and rioting and a lot of outrage over the the murder of George Floyd, which I, I share that outrage. And I support the peaceful protesters who are assembling, and it's especially cool to see worldwide protesters. Um, And there's a lot of changes in the U.S. that are overdue with regard to police brutality and race relations and all that stuff. And it's a weird time to be doing a chess podcast, but I did just want to acknowledge the the larger world before we we drill down on chess. So I'd like to introduce our guest. He is a 19-year-old teenage improver. pretty well known online in the chess world already as he's a prolific chessable author and super user on chessable, uh, US national master. He's a bit of a blitz and a puzzle rush specialist. He's got a chess.com peak rating on blitz of 2588. Um, he's been putting in many hours a day studying chess and reading. So he's taken his rating from 17 something USCF in 2017 and he made USCF master in, in uh, last year. His um, I'll put a link to his rating graph um, his name also came up when Neil Bruce and I talked about the woodpecker method. Um, he's one of the shining exemplars of how much it can help and how, and he's tested a lot of theories about sort of tactics assimilation and space repetition. So excited to talk to him about all that stuff. So let's bring him in. Elijah Logazar, how are you, sir? Oh, hey, I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on here. Oh, my pleasure. Sorry for the long winded intro. We had a, a lot to get into, but, um, so Elijah, we're going to go deep on chess improvement. I know a topic near and dear to your heart that you know a lot about, especially for someone who's only 19. But uh, before that, could you just tell tell our listeners just a little bit about um, where you live and if you're going to school and, and stuff cool. like that? Oh, yeah, sure. I live in Spring Hill, Tennessee, which is near Nashville. Um, and I'm not going to school because I'm working on chess all the time. Awesome. Yeah, that's sort of the impression as someone who follows you on Twitter and comes across your posts on various forums. That's sort of the impression I get. And obviously it's paying off. So um, how many hours a day would you say you've been spending on chess? I mean, I know you do some teaching and you write courses for Chessable as well. So, but how many actual study hours? Um, on, a, on a good day, maybe about 10. Mm. Wow. That's crazy. Um, and do you think in terms of goals, Elijah, or is it just like you want to get as good as you can and whatever happens, happens? I, I do both of them. I have goals, and but the goals are less important than just doing as best I can. And actually, the immediate methods and making sure I can improve my habits are more important than the immediate goals, too, because that will lead to the biggest long-term growth. Goals are ah, oh. measuring that. Yeah, so good good perspective. And um, Elijah, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of dive right into the woodpecker method because um, the uh, the episode that Neil Bruce and I quoted you in where we we got into a little bit about the history of space repetition, uh, Michael de la Maza's work, and then the woodpecker method. Um, I quoted from you because I know I'd seen you discussing it on the forums, and I know you know a lot about this topic. So um, for to begin with, why don't you, could you just walk us through like how you found out about space repetition and what your experience has been with it? So first of all, I've been using Chessable for years. I um, mo- Since basically the first year I came back to tournament chess uh, some four or five years ago. Um, maybe it was a little bit longer than that. But so I've been familiar with Chessable as a platform and I was using it for space repetition when I was younger. Um, I've heard, I've, didn't really use it very much for tactics uh, when I was a young teen. Uh, but when I was using the tactics trainers in variety of forms, I would find that it was sort of a hit and miss whether what I would do would stick or not. And as I got older, I found that more likelihood uh, I would have of seeing the same tactic and for whatever reason, it just wouldn't stick. And that wasn't an issue as a young teen, but it was an issue as an older teen. And so I started using spaced repetition more often. This is especially true because my mentor, David Malliron, explained uh, he's an he's an adult beginner who broke 1950 uscf 
despite uh, not having learned the rules until he was 25. He explained to me a lot of the neurology behind how, how intuitive improvement works. And so I already understood that spaced repetition was an effective method. And I started doing it for dozens of dozen adjustable courses, basically. Um, and, it seems to be, and it seems to work very well. I actually don't, I, I think the woodpecker method has, a, has, the right, has the right idea in the sense that you need, to, you, not all types of tactical training should be based on just improving your calculation habits or visualization or any of that. It should be about making sure you have a specific pattern automated or fully intuitive, which is sort of an unconscious or subconscious thing at, at that point. And to push it there, you need to you need to repeatedly do the, it consciously. Uh, the younger you are, the more likely you are, it seems, based on neuroplasticity, to just absorb it without needing repetitions or as much repetition, or maybe it'll just, it's more likely to be natural. And, and, and okay, direct repetition isn't necessarily needed. Maybe you'll see the same pattern in a variety of forms, but it does seem that it, uh, spaced repetition is a highly effective method to compress it, so to speak where there's almost always some sort of neurological impact in terms of what's stored, but repeating it strengthens the connections until it eventually reaches the point where it doesn't require conscious action and you, uh, except for just seeing the input. Um, I, I don't think the woodpecker method itself uh, gave the right spacing necessarily. I don't uh, necessarily think it's exactly the most efficient, but I think Chessable did it in a way that maximizes uh, retention according to the forgetfulness curve. They don't give you a, unnecessary um unnecessary they don't give you unnecessary repeats but they give you enough repeats to remember it because you're likely to rem to you're more likely to forget a certain uh, material after a certain amount of time and uh and if you repeat at that time then it extends the period exponentially so to speak i would notice that the especially the younger crowd is are more likely to not even need as much time as they're giving you but uh, but it's it's more efficient than the direct method Although for the woodpecker method itself, I didn't use the direct method. I sort of short-term memorized it. I just did three hours a day, uh, prioritized my review over new courses, uh, new tactics, and over the course of about eight days, I memorized the uh, ninety. I went most of the book. I scored ninety-eight percent in three hours, but I didn't remember a lot of the material when I retested myself uh, later. That's because short-term memory doesn't tell you whether it's neurologically compressed or not, even though repeats actually push it closer to compression. And from what I can tell, at the age 17 when I did that, short-term memorization does not guarantee that you will retain the information in the long run if the information that you retain is the type of information that requires neurological input. Although I would note that 15-year-olds uh, should be enough to guarantee that, at least from my discussion with David and testing with Daniel Gersh and his uh, 700 tactics and exercises by Nishtat. Okay. Um, so let me hop in for a minute. Um, as, as we discussed, Elijah, you know so much about this and um, you're so well versed in it that you have a tendency. I mean, uh, it's tremendously insightful, but I think it's almost too much at once. So we're going to try to slow you down a little bit and follow up on a couple of things if it's okay. Um, num number one, uh, could, you, um, could you explain what you mean by the forgetfulness curve? I, I don't know very much about it. I've heard of it. I've, I've seen diagrams on Chessable and it makes sense to me. It, it basically means like, well, these are arbitrary numbers that I'm going to present. So don't like, don't uh, take read too much into them. But let's say you just learned something over the last hour and you're going to remember almost all of it. Even if it's not on your mind, you would just need to like retain through some association or uh, whatever. But in like six or seven hours, that might not be true. Some of it might not be as fresh. In a couple of days, that'll be even less true. Supposedly more and more of the input will have failed to consolidate and more of it will likely to be forgotten. I, I also, I don't think that that's necessarily the whole story. I found that reflection increases how much you remember. Associations increase how much you remember, which is why reflection is important, I think. But also I found that the more emotionally engaged you are with the topic, the more um, you can remember from it. Uh, David also explained this to me. The, uh, he says that, that, if I remember this correctly, um, you're only able to retain X units of information and Y units of time. These vary by age and you can't measure them exactly. This is based on what's consolidated from the working memory. But the, and of course, this doesn't count a reflection-based associative memory bonus. But when you, but according to that, that those ratios can be 
adjusted by emotional engagement because emotion is connected to memory in the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you are able to retain more of the information if it's more interesting to you or if you enjoy it more. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I listen to music when I study, because the most artifact makes it so that uh, emotion is easier to release based on the same amount of input. But so it, okay. it's just like likely to forget things over some things over time and around the moment where you're scientifically more likely to forget is the most efficient time to review. And that's why chessable is effective. So Elijah, it's really interesting what you say about the music. It's It does, from what little I know about neuroscience, it agrees with what's some of what I've read, um, but I haven't heard a lot of uh, chess studiers and provers just talk about it as an explicit way to aid memory. So um, do you do you use like the same song? Although I do remember Neil Bruce actually saying that he used, uh, he liked to listen to music when he's studying. Do you use sp specific songs to sort of bring about a feeling or do you switch it up? Uh, what's your approach? Um, I, since I study a lot, I don't necessarily always have only one song that is associated with study. I have really long playlists that I usually listen to on shuffle and certain ones are maybe more effective or not for different moods and whatnot. So I just switch it up. Okay. And could you also, um, expound a little bit on the, the differences you mentioned vis-a-vis -vis age? Cause it's crazy to me that you're only 19, as you say, neuroplasticity changes with age, but you're still at the point where, um, you know, new neurons can form at a fairly fast pace, but you notice a difference in terms of uh, your pattern pattern assimilation as compared to a few years ago? It's tremendously different. I would say that like three years ago, it was probably at least two to three times faster. And I think it might have been more than that, to be honest. Um, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, really. But so when I was um, 16, for example, I was able to, I, I tested Mm, I, I tested what could see how fast I could peak on chess tempo just by doing a lot of tactics. I did about four to six hours a day for like five or six days in a row. And, and I think I got stuck in some variance band for about four days. And then I immediately peaked by about 50 points when I was much like around that age and maybe a little older. And I was doing a lot of chess tempo and a lot of chess, uh, chess.com tactics and I was in part of this adult improver club that David invited me to, partially so that we could compare results from me and, and the others. I didn't know that at the time. Well, they will measure some results for hard work of something like 100 points in tactics gain in one year. I was reporting going from 2,700 on chess.com's tactics trainer to 3,000 in three weeks by binging. And then I would break 3,900 over the summer. I mean, it was ridiculous. Wow. Uh, as for my... I mean, I was able to make possibly faster progress in some ways when I'm in high school still <laughs> compared to uh, now. But as soon as I graduated high school, I was still 17. Um, and I I immediately had huge gains in terms of my blitz ability, which is useful for measuring some things because um, over the board, you have a blitz baseline and then you supplement it through uh, thought process calculation methods that can be developed through habit. I didn't have these habits because I didn't play tournaments in high school. I didn't play tournaments in high school much because my parents restricted me from doing so because I had bad grades because I was studying chess all the time. <laughs> uh, right. But uh, but when I when I did that, I immediate my blitz went from twenty two fifty to twenty five hundred in seven months, and then as soon as I turned eighteen, it was one hundred points in in one year or so. I mean, the, the difference is really big, and I know that it's not just when you get higher rated, it, it becomes harder. Uh, etc. I mean, I have a teenage friend who was at the same blitz area I was. He's just like two or three years younger than me, and he just leapt forward 150 points. And it's not, and he doesn't work as hard as me. And it's it's not it's not just an outlier either. I know other people who are doing this. I I've I've looked through hundreds of rating graphs of a variety of ages. My mentors looked through thousands, and I can I've up to a certain extent just like look at a rating graph and approximately tell how old you are. Uh, of course, there's outliers based on how hard you work and method, but I found it rare to find an exception. And of course, it's an age range, not an exact age. But I mean, it, it's very, it's much harder, actually. Yeah, it's good that you have that perspective and that you're taking sort of um, a big picture view. A lot of people your age, I think, in, until they find chess improvement a challenge, it's like, who cares? You know, it's like, who cares about the big picture? I just, you know, I'm just going to keep doing what's working. Um, and and thanks to thanks to David Miller and who you mentioned as your mentor. I mean, I appreciate that he's shed so much light on this topic generally. It sounds like someone I should interview at some point. Um, but before I do that, maybe you could shed a little light about just anecdotally what you hear from middle-aged and older people who are trying some of the same methods. 
Well, I mean, it really depends on how old you are, but I also want to say it also depends on whether you learn the rules or not when you're younger. So this is based on the neurological concept known as winnowing. When you are younger, you have an abundance of, of neurons available, but they're, um, you have more than you need. And so I think many of them will be lost if you don't assign them to a skill. Um, that stops happening past 25. You don't lose neurons anymore naturally. So at that point... You don't lose you, neurons? You don't, but there also neurogenesis happens in such small amounts that it's almost inconsequential. Although gotcha. aerobic exercise can increase it, it's not very important. Uh, that's more important when you're younger, but you're actually losing more neurons at this point. I'm still losing neurons. I probably was losing more as a teenager. Uh, sorry, as a younger teenager. But what was it? What was I going to say? Um, when you're younger, you're assigning skills to a circuit. And if you're assigning neurons to a circuit, even if you don't actually use those these in terms of comp neurological compression yet. So if you have, if you like learn the rules, you're like saying, okay, this, this skill might be important. Let's, let's make sure we have extra neurons ready now. Uh, you're, you're sort of teaching your neurons how, to, like you're young enough to like teach them how to connect almost. Your experience that you gained when you're younger not only gives you more neurons available, and it also teaches them how, how to connect more naturally. And so adult beginners are in a special position that makes it much more difficult. If you haven't learned the rules till you're 25, it's, it's very difficult, which makes David's accomplishment so much more impressive because from the data I've seen, it's very likely that if he'd only learned the rules a few years younger, he would have already broke national master by now. But so for, for older people, it really depends on whether, how much you've done already. But as for older people, I, I mean, I, I've co I coach some older people who are managing to progress. Uh, for example, I teach someone who's a senior or almost a senior. I think they're in their sixties. I think they st they learned the rules when they were younger. I'm pretty sure, but they started taking it seriously now. Uh, they haven't played any tournaments yet, but their online metrics imply something of about 1400 USCF or or whatnot. Mm. David told me of an example of of an elder me elderly general gentleman around 50 who worked about 15 to 25 hours a week, and he gradually made it from 1450 or so USCF to 1950 USCF. Although it took him about 20 years. There was another example of someone who uh, who was who was less fortunate than the fifty year old because he uh, didn't ha uh, well he didn't learn the rules when he was younger and uh, and I don't think he had as many neurons available just simply because the type of work he was doing was physical work and so he he didn't have to learn so many skills when he was younger he didn't have much to work with he had to work very hard and I think he put he put like giant hours in for like a decade and went from like nine hundred to like. 1200 or something uh it was like i'm talking giant is in like 30 or 40 i mean of course uh, okay. when you're 50 plus it's, it's, it's much different than like 30s and 40s I, I teach someone who's in their 30s um they made it from from like uh a thousand uscf to like 17 1800 uscf in only a few years although admittedly they were active at 24 and he was working very hard playing tournaments a lot and I think he was an extreme thought process specialist, which means that his intuition baseline required from the neurological level was lower. His chest thought complex was only about 16 or 1700, having him do a lot of speed tactics to work on that. And he's showing very clear peaks on chest tempo and chess.com and puzzle rush. So it's, it's definitely working. Okay. Wow. So, so much information packed into to everything you're saying. I mean, clearly um, uh, um, one early takeaway from this interview is just uh older listeners and I include myself as a 43 year old in this I mean you've just got to have modest expectations I mean and as you say certainly there are outliers but um, you you never want to assume that you're an exception um, so that doesn't mean you can't enjoy and study chess but certainly um, it's challenging and I know science is constantly evolving so not everything is settled but I mean just in terms of I also look at a lot of rating graphs probably not as many as you and David um, but I do, I am struck by just how difficult it is for, you know, anyone, especially a around the age of 30 onward to improve. But um, Elijah, I want to hop into a couple wood woodpecker and space repetition related questions. Um, we've got a bunch of good questions for you. So thank you to all the Patreon supporters who sent them in. But before I do that, Elijah, I just want to take a break to um, hear from our friends at, and your friends as well for, at Chessable. Speaking of Chessable, of course USCF master Elijah Logazar is friendly with them because in addition to being a power user of their product, he has put out lots of courses for them that are affordable and highly reviewed. When you hear Elijah talk about how he uses chess engines later in this interview, it'll become clear why his opening courses are well received. 
Elijah has written Crush the Taimanov, Crush the London, and 1E4, A Comprehensive Repertoire, just to name a few of his offerings. He has even more coming soon, so go to chessable.com and check out his courses while they are on sale. So question number one actually is related to a blog post by a um, a um, Twitter person um, named Flamingo Chess, and I think his blog is called Flamingo Chess as well. Um, so he had been, I think he he had been doing the woodpecker method. I'm not sure how old he is, but I think he's a class A player, and I, I'm I believe he's in his 50s. So apologies if I'm wrong, but in any event, he he wrote a post expressing some frustrations and was kind of venting about it on Twitter. And I just tried to synthesize what he wrote into a question for you, Elijah, and uh, I'll link to the blog post in the show description. So Flamingo was saying. Um, he says, I've been trying the woodpecker method, but I found, or actually he didn't say, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I've been trying the woodpecker method, but found it frustrating at times. I'm a class A player and I'm finding the intermediate level questions to be uneven, uneven in level and worse yet, some of the solutions are not entirely clear. As a result, I'm spending lots of time on some of the puzzles and either not getting the whole answer or finding the answer a bit unsatisfying. Should I continue with the woodpecker method? So what do you think, Elijah? I think the Woodpecker Method is a good book, but it also is not the ideal puzzle set for the uh, compression or spaced repetition or Woodpecker, whatever you want to call it, method, specifically for the sake of neurological automation, specific for club players. I think the difficulty is just too high. Uh, For example, International Master Kostya Kavitsky, he was trying to Woodpecker and automate it, but he's already an International Master. And presumably, he would already see automatically, in many cases, more than an A player would see in a slow game with a really effective thought process. And and when Kosti was doing it, he would get a lot of repeats. And uh, and when he was repeating, he still sometimes wouldn't be able to solve it quickly. He was slowly calculating through it. If an international master has to slowly calculate through a lot of the a lot of the solutions, even after having already seen it, maybe it's not the ideal book for an A player. Uh, uh, though it's, I mean, it's not a bad book. Uh, the puzzle set's very good. But it's also, it's, you're trying to automate the basics here. You're trying to make sure you see all of the most basic things so that you can have a foundation to calculate on that's bigger than you had before. And uh, But if you if you try to do that now, maybe a lot of the basics that would help you automate this more easily because it'll plug into a network that uh, already exists would... Mm-hmm. It's, it's going to be a lot harder without, uh, without having a more of the basic patterns already. And... So, I mean, okay, I mean, you could continue the book, but if you want to test Woodpecker method or space repetition, um, high volume speed tactics or any of that sort of thing, it might be more appropriate to try an easier puzzle set and just do that on the side for your calculation training. Um, Also, I would say the puzzle set might be too small. Um, What I mean by that is from what I've seen for, especially for adult improvement, the more you do, the more important, the more you do is. Uh, That might have been poorly phrased. What, What I mean is, there seems to be some sort of a snowball effect, uh, some sort of tipping point that means that after a certain point of training, your training for that week or day or whatever is more valuable, probably because of spaced repetition of similar tactics, um, cross-contextualization in your associative memory, um, and and the fact that adults just need more input to store the same pattern. And so you might as well just like make sure you remember more through uh, through that sort of cross-application while you can. Uh, it's only a it's only a thousand puzzles. Okay, that's it's going to be helpful to do that. But when I heard about adults in the adult improving group, and it was working very well actually, uh, doing this sort of training, I, I think they called it salt mines training. Uh, they would they would do very high volume. I would see their chest tempo, and they'd be like doing six thousand puzzles in one month. Or I would see they would be doing uh, other things. David was at some months putting in between thirty five thousand and one hundred and twenty thousand tactics per month consistently over a relatively large scale period of time and these are these are to be clear not super challenging tactics um like it's more well, about the pattern than the the difficulty well that's right there there might be some puzzles that were hard for you the first time but you're still repeating it but i would say for the most part it was salt mines training uh that is um repeats of easier tactics to make sure you have everything uh simple automated like for example i i think there was this one user poker ram on chess tempo, he would repeat, he would deliberately go below his uh, puzzle set and go for specific uh, motifs or whatnot. And then he, or puzzles he missed. And then he would just repeat within a set. I I think Randy Julian was doing that. Um, He would just do high volume, easier tactics within a set to make sure he would have them all automated. But it's also okay to do harder tactics. Um, But 
preferably not significantly above your ability. I think a really good app for adults is the is the Chess IMO app. It has about thirty five thousand tactics, um, and it Chess it I-O, only, I-O, sorry Ch- I-O. Ch- Chess I M O I M O. Oh right right okay. Because it has a lot of spaced repetition built in, but it starts with the easiest ta- it, it has a lot of hard tactics, but it starts with easy tactics, and every harder tactic on the entire platform is based on an ex- earlier tactic that you already learned in a simpler form, and it's the exact position, actually, I think. So you can build your way up to harder ones through that allows that allows you to woodpeck, so to speak, harder ones. It will repeat, although not immediately, so that's spaced repetition, and it starts from the basics, so it, it's, it's a fantastic app. I think David said he went through it twice. Okay. So, I mean, just to give more more general ad- advice, though, like if you're an adult improver, and I, I mean, I think a lot of the people you definitely, and a lot of the people that, that are in this group, I mean, I think they're the, the hardest of the hardcore. So props to them. But I think a lot of people might feel like they don't have as much time as these people are putting in. Um, so you would say, to synthesize, Um, focus more on repetition than difficulty, but it should be a large problem set? Uh, Yeah, I would say it should be a large problem set. Um, As for difficulty, I'm not saying don't choose difficult problems. I'm saying don't choose exceptionally difficult problems. It shouldn't be the sort of thing that, that for the most part, you aren't able to solve slowly within a minute and a half the first time you try it kind of thing. Because you want to be able to put... It's really hard to push something that's like really, really advanced to compression uh, uh, because it requires so many repetitions and you have, there's so, there's so much supposed underlying information that needs to be stored. Uh, like it just makes sense to start on something of moderate difficulty and, and push it forwards kind of thing, or, or even faster, even lower difficulty, but uh, make sure you can go from like 30 seconds to like seven. And once you're at seven, you're, you're usually good. Uh, also, okay. um, from what I've noticed, this is okay, obviously less true for me, but I was advised by David when you're uh, when you're an adult improver, you don't like expect all your metrics to peak immediately. You have to watch all the metrics, and if some of them are peaking, you're doing a good job. Okay, um, and the metrics would be it could be any of your uh, over the border online ratings, basically that you have a uh, sufficiently high sample size to uh, to be stable. Okay. Um... Yeah. I mean, I think it's just tough for some people because they, I mean, if you have an hour a day, you spend it doing tactics, you don't even have time to gather metrics, you know? Um, that's, like, uh, well, that is, that, that's true. Uh, from what I've seen in, in uh, adults in the 25 plus range and what I've heard, it seems to be that you don't have uh, metric gains until 45 days or so for the most part, unless, unless the game okay. there, and if there is gains, yeah, Probably it's not major, and if it and it, and most likely it's just too small sample size. You don't know your variance band yet, kind of thing. Um, but it, usually, the, if you're doing enough, there is some sort of gain at that point. Uh, although in some special circumstances, I would say this is probably true for especially older adults. I would say maybe forty or fifty plus. Though I'm not sure. I'm just theorizing from what I've seen. And for adult beginners, uh, it, it might it's a lot more likely to stick from short term memory compression or whatever into a long term neural network automation if you also apply it in a game. So David did high volume bullet chess uh, after doing an enormous volume blitz, and he would always analyze his games as a way of consolidating. He told me that he would sometimes do spaced repetition uh, enough to make sure that he could solve all of the puzzles in a set quickly, and he would retest himself later, and he could not remember hardly any of them. And he has a phenomenal memory, but tactics are the sort of thing that in order to memorize in the long run, you need some sort of pattern in your neural network. So, but then he tested it regarding speed chess, and he analyzed it. And when he applied the pattern, he found that it stuck. So he had to get it so that he could apply it quickly. He'd have the information in his short-term mem- memory, or maybe neurologically, but not consolidated. Not sure how that works. But when he applied it, it worked. So that's something worth keeping in mind. Speed chess has its, uh, has its place. Okay. All right. Um, and one more um, two-part question relating to uh, tactical training and space repetition. This one is from Patreon supporter of the show, Ed Daly. Um, thanks for the support, Ed. And Ed asks, he says, uh, this is a two-part question regarding tactical training. I'd be interested in Elijah's views on which approach he prefers, the woodpecker types versus solving random problems without the repetition, like chess.com or chess tempo tactics trainers. The second part of the question is, regard. oh, we already kind of, let's just stop there for a second. So where do general tactics trainers fit into all of this, Elijah? I know you're quite a wizard on uh, the chess.com tactics trainer. 
Well, one of the reasons why I got so good at chess.com and chess tempo and got to like, well, on chess.com, it was number 34 out of about 775,000. And on chess tempo, it was number two on the website for Blitz Tactics. Um, it, it was uh, the reason I was able to get so high was because I was doing so much that it was as if I was like just just doing spaced repetition for a, a giant puzzle set. I would get a, not, a lot of repeats. Like on chess tempo, there was this point, there was a point where I was doing, uh, I remember one day before I was studying Kasparov with my great predecessors with David, I think I got like 830 puzzles on chess tempo that day. I would have just, I would just repeat, repeat. I would just cycle through a giant set and eventually a lot of them just compressed or I would remember them. And, and then I would get harder puzzles later because I've just, because I've already got through those. And I think that happened with chess.com too. In the higher up ranges, they just don't have as many puzzles. And I happen to, uh, already be strong enough at tactics because of what I did as a young teen that I, I was able to get to that point and through high volume just like push through basically. Um, but as for overall, um, it has its place. With spaced repetition, you're only getting the same positions. With general solving, you get to uh, you get the same patterns in a lot of cases, but different exact positions. Um, as mentioned already, there seems to be this sort of associative memory cross application of, of similar positions, similar patterns that make it more likely that any of them will stick. Um, in that regard, for high so volume training. So when you do chess.com, you're like putting more volume in, so to speak, or you're having things that would contextualize with what you're doing spaced repetition. And if you do enough, it should be spaced repetition. But I really don't know. I, I can't give a universal answer because it would vary by age. But David was also doing, he would do spaced repetition. He would do specific puzzle sets, but he would also do the the those um, chess.com, chess tempo sort of things. And I could think of at least two benefits that, to doing so. One of which is you in your rating, uh, you have a rating there. It's a metric for your improvement. It likely will matter to you if you care about improvement. And therefore, you're more likely to be emotionally engaged, celebrating if you get something right or <laughs> no, if I got something wrong. Uh, right. So uh, if that happens, you're increasing the number of units of information you can retain in that period of time. There are ways you can still do that um, regarding with spaced repetition. And I, I uh, in the right mindset, I enjoy repetition training as well but it that does seem to be a bit of a natural bonus another thing is that you know which puzzles you get wrong because you've definitely tried them if you're trying some chessable course and you're just going to repeat everything you might be repeating puzzles that you already got right quickly and so there might be some efficiency lost there and it might be too te like too tedious just to like pause every puzzle you've solved quickly already with chess.com or chess tempo you can you can just do a large set for a day and then import the puzzles you got wrong into a private chessable, uh, chessable or whatever space repetition set. I did this when I was climbing quickly. I know other people have done private sets, so there's other platforms besides chessable for this, but it's effective. I've tried it. Other people have tried it. And, and you already have your emotional association because because of your rating or you're wanting to prove yourself with this or that or or whatever. So now you now you can repeat it. You have a very, very specific pattern or a position you want to target that you know you couldn't solve. And also you could the whole purpose of repetition is to compress to automation. So you would only do this for the ones that would be more most uh, beneficial for that. For example, seven seconds or so tends to be the automation point based on David's data. But it seems to me that within 15 seconds and 45 seconds, it's not automation, but partially it's neurologically there. Slower than that, it's calculation training. And you had some of the information, but it's nowhere near automated. So if you... So what you could do is you could try to slow solve puzzles uh, for accuracy on one of these metrics. And you care about your rating, so that's going to be a good way to get your rating up maybe. But anything that you solve slower than 45 seconds maybe would be good to import into a private puzzle set for you to drill. Also puzzles that you got wrong after trying hard and, and whatnot. And then you have a specific spaced repetition set that is designed specifically for you for you that is based on what you miss but isn't, but isn't exceptionally difficult. And... Uh, makes sense to do this. Also for me in Puzzle Rush, for example, I also spaced repetition this. I do enough volume that despite chess.com is a big puzzle set, but I get repeats all the time. So I might be like, oh, I missed this one before. Or sometimes I might be like, oh, I've missed this three or four times already. I hope I don't miss this next time. But, right. uh, but, some, but then eventually I, I tend to get it right. And, um, and, it, and it seems to be working very well. That's uh, a very high puzzle, a very big puzzle set, about 120 by 150,000 puzzles, they had about a thousand a week. So, if I can compress a large portion of that, it would be uh, very good for my tactical ability, I would think. 
Wow. Okay. And just out of curiosity, Elijah, I mean, we've had so many Grandmaster guests on this show talk about the importance of doing uh, end game studies. Is that something you're incorporating into your 10 hours a day? Or are you more about just straight up sort of tactics puzzles along with all the other stuff, which we'll get to? Well, not right now, but I agree that it's very important. Uh, when I was younger, uh, I David knew I was a, a blitz specialist, and I was so much so that I didn't even realize the importance of that. Uh, he was advising me to solve one or two endgame studies a day because, with Russian method. Make sure you see everything before you move. And I highly attribute a lot of my slower progress and, and huge deficiency in blitz compared to standard to be the fact that I didn't follow that advice when I was younger, which would make the habits flow more easily. Because it would allow me to structure my thinking. You are forced to structure your thinking because you have to see so much to get it correct. But only the relevant elements are present and you know there's an answer. So it's highly effective in that way. And there's important tactical patterns there too. I would say end game studies are important for calculation training. And I don't mean calculation as in improving your visualization. I mean calculation as in improving your structure of thinking, which would impact things over the board. This matters quite a bit, I would say. Um, and it's something I need to work on and am working on. And my current schedule has about three hours a day of, ta- uh, of calculation training on it. So, but not end game studies right now. Um, although I'm, I'm sure that Dever, I'm pretty sure that Deveretsky's analytic manual, which I'm going through, uh, I'm, I'm on section two right now. I think it might get into where it has a bunch of end games. It might start doing end game studies soon, but, uh, end game studies are something important for, and is one of the fact of, of many effective methods for calculation training, structuring your thinking. But for strong players, they're really strong players, experts and masters. You often can just visualize, you can play blindfold anyway. You can visualize really deeply. There might be some natural limit where you have to like really push hard to push past it. But for the most part, that's less of an issue. It helps with structuring your thinking. For lower than that and in that range to improve it, blindfold, uh, um, um, end game studies also help you uh, deepen your natural visualization um which can increase your tactical ceiling as well, I would say. Uh, my brothers are both teenagers, and they're testing this theory, actually, not with endgame studies, but with what you can naturally um, automate based on how deeply you can see easily. And one of them is 17 years old, and the other one is fi- almost 15. The one who is 17 uh, has, fa- has been improving significantly faster than the one who is 15, despite supposedly being able to do it slower. And the reason for that is his method for tactics was much more effective. The younger one decided, okay, I'm just going to do repeats of tactics. And I don't really care too much if I get it right. I just want to do repeats. And he did some 30,000 tactics. And it uh, it worked reasonably well. He went from about 1,700 on chess.com's tactics trainer to about 2,250 with his peak. He was going very, very fast. When he peaked, he was 25 seconds on average. And usually it was faster. The other one went from about 1,700 to about 2,930. This is in a period of about nine months, by the way, with about an hour a day kind of thing. Um, and what he would do is he would solve slowly for accuracy and only solve quickly if he was confi- relatively confident he'd get it right. The problem, the younger one I found, is that he never developed visualization ability sufficient to go much beyond his rating, even though he's young enough to easily do so with the right methods. He would, he would, he tells me now he struggles with the visualizing deeper things, and uh, but the older one doesn't really struggle with this. Neither of them had much tournament experience. So we're, so to speak, starting from scratch at about a thousand USCF level. Um, he would, uh, so calculating slowly, there's a natural point where you can't easily visualize anymore, but you can still do it. It just takes effort, takes focus. You have to try hard for it, but okay. Obviously how quickly it scales depends on your age and other factors. But, um, with, the the 17 year old brother, because he did it slowly, he was then able to visualize that deeply uh, quickly. That doesn't mean he necessarily had the patterns, but if he did have the patterns, he would be able to go there uh, quicker. So with end game studies, you're able to push the limits of how fa- uh, how deep you're able to naturally visualize. And that allows you to have a, high, uh, a higher tactical ceiling for storing of patterns from what I can tell. Okay. But mostly the benefit is for calculation structure. Okay. Um, cool. Well, I mean, Elijah, it's so much fun to pick your brain about tactics, but we want to talk about the other elements of the game um, as well. And we got a couple opening related uh, Patreon questions, um, oh, sure. which, which of course, I know you've you've published a bunch of courses on Chessable related to openings. Um, so the first one I would say um, is uh, um, um, 
timeless question, which is when different opening authors offer different opinions, um, how do you decide which one to follow on a, like different opinions on a given opening or in, in a given line? Well, I'm less inclined to just believe what I read in the books anyways, but it's a good starting point. When I was younger, I, I didn't really have a, a coach for most of that. So I just started doing my own opening research and uh, got used to that. Uh, I use databases, I use books, but um, I, I use computers. I, I don't necessarily always trust any of the sources individually sometimes. And if I have a sufficient reason for doubting, a, I mean, if, if I have no reason to doubt and the, I believe the evaluation looks correct, et cetera, all right, that's that's fine. If I do, then I often analyze further. And right now, one of the main tools that I use is supplement other resources is that I analyze with Leela Zero on a high-speed server that can get to high depth very quickly. That's not to say that I always believe Leela Zero either. There have been times where it's like, this doesn't look right, let's analyze deeper. Or uh, um, I, I, I've read some books on how computers work, so I have uh, some idea of how of, of when to not believe what the computer is telling me. Um, like, for example, Matthew Sadler's Alpha Zero book, um, he clarifies that... Yes, it's a game changer. It's 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 very it's very good, and uh, it told me some things I was already suspecting, and some things that I didn't know yet. One of the things that I uh, he noticed was that most chess engines, and I will say Leela Zero included, actually, um, although less so perhaps, um, is that there tends to be a type of zero point zero zero positions that are that are completely wrong or uh, wrong, this incorrectly evaluated by the computers. There is no perpetual. But they're saying 0.00. There's this strange repetition of moves when there is no perpetual to the king or any necessity of doing so. The reason they're doing that is because it's too complicated. They, they don't want to make a decision about how to play, make commitments in the long run. Let's say you have a backward pawn on the queen side, or you might lose that pawn if you, don't, if you throw all your pieces to the king side. But you can't break through yet. You need to improve, 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 and then pawn lever, and then uh, and then some twenty moves later, you'll sacrifice something, uh, or some transformation will happen on the way. Well, in the meantime, the computer is not going to see that transformation. It's going to look for the forcing moves now, and it'll only do the non-forcing moves if it sees a good reason. And so it, it's it's going to be harder for it to find twenty moves of buildup. In the meantime, the c three pawn drops off. What next? Well, I know, mm -hmm. let's do some sort of in-between where I don't commit enough pieces to prepare a breakthrough, but I also don't commit enough pieces to lose the pawn, and the opponent doesn't commit enough pieces to bring the pieces to the queen side to attack, which would make the breakthrough faster, and let's just both, like, so say, oh, let's just draw, okay? That's basically what was happening with Alpha right. Zero and Stockfish. Stockfish would be, like, 0.00, .00 and Alpha Zero is like, are you kidding me? In 20 moves, I will break through. <laughs> and, right. this kept and this kept happening. Um and this is also true positionally sometimes with little progress, little progress. It's still a draw probably, but you, but there's a tipping point. Steinitz's theory of advantages, you, you want to keep accumulating these advantages and they can compound if you, if you prevent the opponent's counterplay. Alpha Zero would do this to against Stockfish so that uh, Stockfish would make little concessions and Alpha Zero would slowly increase its progressive score. And Stockfish would say 0.00, .00 and then it would eventually jump up massively. It wouldn't notice any sort of transitioning point, but that's because it would see a breakthrough now. But humans can sort of see the long-term trends, so to speak, sometimes. You don't always believe the computer. You have some idea of what the computer's strengths are that you can't match, and some things that you can see that you know the computers either can't see easily, or if they can see it, they will see it because you've guided them, you've put the moves on the board so they wouldn't calculate all the nonsense on the way. So to <laughs> and then and then you have and you, you have to guide the computer. Uh, you don't always believe. What, I remember one specific example where I was investigating a line in the French defense based on an alpha zero idea. And Leal is zero said 0, 0.00. And I didn't believe that. It's like, well, it's, it's so complicated. How could it be 0, 0.00? So then I just analyzed it out. And apparently there was a breakthrough. It just wasn't seeing it. And this breakthrough is usually side for the attacker. Um, and uh, the attacker was eventually winning. So with that in mind, um, also... Regarding computers again, Leela Zero is very good compared to other engines of detecting uh, long-term sacrifices from the general point of view, but it still has, it, it won't always see the tactical breakthrough. And Stockfish needs the tactical breakthrough sometimes or it won't just trust the sacrifice. But because the breakthrough is almost always happening on the attacking side, uh, a lot of sacrifices and uh, dynamic opportunities that were previously thought to be unsound or, or implausible are turning out to be sound and uh, correct. And actually, I think mm -hmm. chess development is trending in that direction, looking for these. But you have to, you don't trust every uh, anything unconditionally unless you, uh, in, the, in the sense that if you have a reason to disbelieve it, all right, critically analyze. And and if there's evidence that you're wrong after that, okay, correct, 
correct with your viewpoint, but try to like try to like go beyond what you're shown uh, in the search for the truth. Actually, that, there's okay. an interesting. What, well, there's one interesting thing about that. The Trojan specifically discusses this in his book, The Trojan's Legacy. When he was younger, he would talk about how he would often, he had a great memory for chess, and he would often study a lot of opening books. And he would remember what was the evaluations and the recommendations. And then he would go into some tournament and he's all confident because he has his opening preparation or whatever. And then somewhat he'd play in his line and he'd lose the game out of the opening <laughs> because somebody else read that book and found an improvement also. And he didn't know about that. Um, I think Alakine also had the same thing. Uh, you don't just critically believe what you're taught. You believe unless you have a reason not to. And then you analyze on your own. And, and if you disagree with the authority, okay, maybe you're wrong. But like you have to believe that there's a chance of it being wrong sometimes. And then you can uh, you have your own ideas too. Okay, yeah. And of course, in the engine age, it certainly helps. You're not just uh, flying blind. You're able to to at least check and make sure you're not missing anything obvious with your suggestion. And to, I don't know Thomas's rating, but I, I, I have to say, Elijah, I suspect that, that your answer might be a little more detailed than like the amount of work that a lot of people can do. Um, but so I would just add that, that for people who don't have chess base or don't have um, Leela built into their computers, you know, you can use the lead chess analysis board and just quickly test something. But also, I mean, I, do you agree, Elijah, that like if there's not a big if two different authors are saying two different things and there's not a big difference in the evaluation of the engine for most club level players, I think you can decide based on comfort. Do you think that that's true for like, I don't know, Absolutely. say an 1800 player? What's absolutely. Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. I think that's true. Not only do I think it's true, I think, uh, uh, sorry, I think that, it, I think that it's true. I think that more important is just making sure that you master the material you're presented. And I mean, uh, David got to 1950 and he commented that the, the Danish gambit was playable at his level. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. so, I mean, if, if, if the Danish gambit, which can be declined on the third move with an equal position for black in like two different ways, uh, then it's playable and some people in 1800 don't know that the third move there then maybe it's more important to just know what you're understand the plans uh know the concrete variations and, and as for uh i think vishnu also had a question didn't he um how deep are you yeah. supposed to learn well okay so um, we'll, we'll hop into that one now so uh vishnu srikumar um friend of the podcast, active on uh, chess Twitter and active adult improver, um, asks, he says, given that you've put in serious hours into openings and authoring chessable opening courses, typically how often do you get your prep on the board and typically up to what move number? Um, and how do you work on other areas of chess like the end game? Do you analyze your games without an engine first? So a lot of questions there, but let's start with the opening stuff. Yeah. Okay. So as for the first one, I get my preparation on the board a lot and I've actually won a lot of games just flat out out of the opening. I remember, uh, at the, at the tournament, um, the Boston chess Congress, uh, about a year and a half ago, I remember winning the last round and I played the first 20 ish moves, 25 ish moves already before. And, um, uh, there was a transposition of moves and, uh, okay. He was already lost at that point. My opponent was 2,100. Right. <laughs> Uh, I've had this happen as black before where I just, where I sometimes crush people uh, in certain sharp lines I prepared already. And uh, okay, it's not happening all the time, but it's quite often that I have my preparation on the board and I uh, have a lot of people falling for the same traps or uh, deeper things. I remember an example recently where I was playing an online blitz tournament. Um, sorry, online blitz titled Tuesday, I think it was. Yeah. Um, and I was paired against this, uh, this grandmaster with a rating of about 2950. And I, I don't exactly want to call out who he was, but after playing me, he accused me of cheating on his stream, but really I just prepared the, I, I prepared, we, I transposed into my preparation on move 17 in a very sharp Sicilian line. I missed a couple opportunities to punish his move order. And then after he made a mistake, I was just calculating the, the, the finish basically. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that makes sense if, with, with your level of preparation. Um, so out of your 10 hours a day, Elijah, but, how, how much are you spending uh, on openings? Well, first of all, I hadn't actually answered the question yet. So in some openings, you have to prepare deeper. In other openings, you can like end on like very early. So what is the answer to that? Well, I see this partially from the perspective of Lip uh, Isaac Lipnitsky in his book, Questions of Modern Chess Theory from the 50s. I think it was the 50s. Um, variation. The purpose of variations is to go from a position that you need to calculate to a position that you can evaluate and play according to generalizations. So... From the opening point of view, there's a lot of very concrete transformations that change the speed of the position, the nature of the position, um, the, the tactics. You have to know these. 
And if it slows down, you can end there and learn the plan. And it's also possible okay. for you to choose the opening so that you can end earlier. But it's also sharp openings reward good preparation, but it also hurts. It also punishes you for bad preparation. So it depends how much preparation time you have and, and that sort of thing. Um, as for how much time I spend, uh, <laughs> most people don't believe me if I say this. I don't spend most, I, I spend very little of my time on the opening. Um, I, most of my, I mean, I, I do like when there's a chessable project I'm working on because I, I find some cool idea that I want to learn myself better and making a chessable course forces me to be professional about it and make some money at the same time. All right. And I can drill it efficiently so I can learn it. And then like, it'll be hardly taking any of my time at all after I drill it. But uh, other than these chessable projects and like occasional, oh, I noticed that this line is not as good as something I could learn. Let's just spend a day or two like, uh, make, making sure I improve this repertoire. I I don't really do openings hardly at all. I mean, when I go through various books on annotated games and whatnot, I still pay attention to the opening phase of the game, and I tend to remember quite a lot based on associations and interest and whatever else. And so I just pile up a lot of knowledge that way. But and and because Chessable is so efficient for memorization, when I go through my, I'm gonna do make this course and memorize it. I can memorize almost all of the material and just move on and just like review it spartaically. And this might be a 150 variation course that averages like 15, 20 move depth. Like I did recently with Crush the Time and Off. Uh, I recently memorized the vast majority of my soon to be published, the Ambitious Berlin course, which had about 500 variations. I can do this based on my morning chessable project time or, or, or my sometimes evening chessable review. It doesn't take very long. Chessable is efficient. I, okay. I, I, it probably helps that I've learned how to efficiently uh, research. Yeah, and uh, of course, your writing these courses puts you in kind of a unique position compared to, to most improvers. Um, let me just read an, one more question because it touches on a lot of what we're talking about right now. Uh, the last well, the last opening-related Patreon question um, from Negmat Maladjanov. I hope I said your name remotely correctly, Negmat. Thank you for the support. So Negmat says, two questions from your testable courses page. It looks like you've published 10 courses already. I suspect it's not an easy task. Can you talk about your experience? So you already did that a bit. And number two, what percentage of your chess study is spent on chessable.com? From your experience, how, how would you advise chessable system is to be used to get the most value out of it? Okay, um, chessable is a memorization factory. And so if the purpose is, if it's, if, if it's especially memory sensitive, then it should, be, um, it should be done more often. Like for opening variations, you don't want to only know the generalizations. You want to know the concrete variations when it gets tactical. You want to know uh, the transformations. When it, for theoretical end games, you don't want to just know the general ideas. You want to memorize the theoretical end games. Do Deveretsky's end game manual. Do 100 end games you must know. So chessable is great for opening preparation and for end games. What else is it good for? It's good for neurological compression when spaced repetition is the ideal method. Things that would woodpeck. Okay, chessable is efficient. You could do it there. For the most part, otherwise, I mean, I'm not really sure. I mean, maybe if you really enjoy it, but I don't really think it's the place for an annotated games collection unless unless the author did a good job of like finding key moments that are worth memorizing or, I mean, it's, it's okay. It'll be efficient. Kind of like forward chess, you could just uh, play through the moves easier. Uh, and and definitely with a good test of the critical moments, uh, things worth mem remembering, can, it can add value. But let's imagine the author doesn't do that. Let's imagine he just adds annotated games. Okay, that's not what you're using Chessable for. You're using it for memorization and compression. Okay. And um, as a Chessable super user, what about his question, what percent of your chess study time is spent using Chessable? With, with Chessable... Uh, I would say an hour a day in the evening makes sense, but because you'll remember best before bed, you haven't had given them time for the forgetfulness curve. It might be more fresh before for reflection or whatever. But I, I say this loosely because Chessable is just so efficient for memorization that you don't need to do this in the long run. At some point, you'll just have memorized your variations for the most part and just be spending like two minutes on your course. Okay. Yeah. And bear in mind that when Elijah says an hour an evening for him, that's 10% or something of the time. So, I mean, most people, again, are going to be working with much smaller blocks of time, but I think that's, that's good general advice. I would say if anything, maybe a little higher if you're, because I think 10% for openings might be good, but then anything you're doing beyond that, like Elijah mentioned end games and, uh, and tactics training yeah. stuff, um, can certainly, sure. uh, up, up it consist uh, considerably, excuse me. 
Um, and yeah. let's just circle back to uh, Vishnu's question about analyzing your games. Where does that all fit in, Elijah? Do you use an engine? And how seriously are you analyzing? I know you're playing mostly Blitz online, especially due to circumstances right now. How, how seriously do you analyze them? Well, I mean, the purpose of analyzing your Blitz games is completely different than the purpose then for analyzing your standard games. The right. purpose for analyzing your standard games, of course you want to improve your understanding, but for me at least, it mostly is, let's pinpoint my decision-making mistakes. Where did I use the improper calculation structure? Did I miscategorize this type of decision? Where was my time management? Uh, is like that sort of thing. I'm working on my thought process, calculation methods, and habits with my over-the-board games, and I need to scrutinize that of them very carefully in a lot of cases. But, uh, I mean, it depends on the person. And, of course, game analysis is very important. I think Mark Javoretsky make it, made it clear that this is possibly the most important. I, I don't remember for sure, but I think Kasparov might have agreed with that. I think Bothanek taught him to do that. Um, it's, it's very important to analyze your games because you can diagnose specific issues that you have, and then you can consciously work on that, put your reflection to good use, and then you'll remember the relevant things. But with over-the-board game analysis, I spend a lot of time on some of them. Uh, of course, I check the engine a lot, a lot of the time, but not necessarily immediately. I mean, uh, I remember I, I sometimes go out of my way not to check the engine for a while because I like to go through the games with my coach uh, and have him discuss things from the general point of view. Um, and if there's concrete details, if he missed, okay, fine. He's he, he's not going to be a computer at tactics all the time. But the generalizations are what I'm interested in for for positional chess. And the and for my decision making, I need to scrutinize both with computer giving me objective uh, input in many for tactics and whatnot, as well as my own understanding of what I saw, what I didn't see, and just start categorizing more carefully after the fact. It's it can take a long time, but. I wouldn't say it's like 16 hours for one game. It's like probably like uh, less time than the game took, but it it's it's very serious. Um, as for uh, oh, blitz games, yes, I analyze my blitz games. Um, for the most part, it's just uh, let's use the retry mistakes feature on chess.com and, you know, for the most okay. important tactical mistakes. Occasionally it might be like, well, I had a question about that during the game. Uh, I've been studying this topic a lot. I just kind of, I'm just curious about this strategic moment that I didn't know what I'm doing. It can be effective when combining with uh, uh, content, but usually for Blitz to have be effective for uh, improving your intuition, you should be doing a lot more training than Blitz. And I, I'm not really playing Blitz that much right now, but I'm probably going to come back to it and do a lot more at some point. Okay. Um, all right. We have one more listener question, but first we want to take an, another break, Eliza, to hear from a new sponsor. Hey, Perpetual Chess listeners, I want to tell you about the first AI chess tutor, Decode Chess. If you find it frustrating when a chess engine recommends a move without an explanation, Decode Chess is designed to help you make sense of those recommendations and to help you understand the why behind the moves. Decode Chess explains every move recommended by the chess engine Stockfish in plain language in order to give you a full picture of what's going on in a position. Decode Chess is currently most effective for players rated around 1800 ELO and below, but can also provide value for stronger players and for parents who are trying to help their kids improve. GMs Dayan Bakov and Boris Gelfon have already recommended it, as have many other titled players and chess tutors. For an example of the system's capabilities, please visit decodechess.com and try it out free of charge. Okay, um, so this last question, you of course have mentioned, Elijah, um, your your work with David Milyern, and I know you've got a little community of people that you're working with. So this is a related question from Augusto Ruyoba. Again, I hope I said the name right, Augusto. Uh, he says, I'm a class A player, and since my chess club is closed, I've recently started playing longer games online game 45. It's not easy to find sparring partners, although the Discord channel of Chess Dojo has been of great help. Do you play long long time control games online? If so, do you have one or several training partners? If not, do you think it's okay to have only few training partners or is there a benefit for searching for several? I don't play the online slow chess very much right now, but I've done it before. Uh, I, I, have, I, I do have training partners. I have a lot of training partners actually. Um, mostly for studying various things with or analyzing openings with or puzzle battle on chess.com or something. <laughs> but, mm. uh, but they're mostly just friends that I met on the way. And, 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 it, and it's fun. It's more, it's more fun to study with friends usually, but, uh, but sometimes it's like, if you have this group of friends who you study with, sometimes that sometimes you, sometimes it makes sense to, uh, for both of you to play training games with each other online. And, um, and I, and I have training partners like that. I'm just not, 
playing slow chess online much. I, I prefer to play over the board and uh, I, I need to work on my calculation habits a bit more, I think. But I, I've done it before for sure. Uh, as for looking for it, uh, I mean, you could. It, it's definitely beneficial. Agard recommended it in Thinking Inside the Box. He says it increases your enjoyment and it, motivation. And I think there's some psychology aspects that uh, make it more easy to do difficult uh, work if you know somebody else is also going to do that. <laughs> Okay, good stuff. And speaking of uh, Agard's thinking inside the box, the last big topic I want to hit before we uh, call it a day, Elijah, is chess books. I know you, you're uh, a voracious reader of them. So, um, and you, we before we were recording, you mentioned you're building a collection um, already. You've, I'm sure it'll be huge by the time you're all said and done. Um, so, what are some of your favorites, Elijah? Uh, okay, my favorites. Well, speaking of thinking inside the box, that is my favorite book, uh, chess book so far. So, I think. Okay, it's it's by far my favorite. Not only does it give you a framework for understanding things from the intuition point of view, it gives you a framework for understanding things from the calculation thought process point of view, and a framework for understanding things from the psychology point of view. And I can be very harsh with how I review books, but I think that almost everything in that book is absolutely precise. Wow, high praise. Although not you're not you're certainly um not going out on a limb there. It's a wonderful book, and uh, GM Agard's reputation is well deserved. Um, what else you got? Well, Agard is my favorite author who's alive right now. Deveretsky, I think, is the highest. Uh, Agard and Deveretsky together are the best. But this is mostly for 2,000-plus uh, players. Before that, um, well, it depends It depends on what you're trying to look for, obviously. I, I, I believe in generalizations as a method of categorizing consciously. Uh, and I think this is very important for my philosophy of reading books uh, and as a whole, I think. Because when you... When you, when you read a chess book and you're trying to improve your intuition, you need to have some framework for understanding what is going on. And generalizations are based on objective truths in chess a lot of the time because the pieces move the same way for everyone. You should try to find out how it works. Now, some people may misinterpret the generalizations because all of the exact details for the generalization might take too long to explain. But I think the generalization represents, uh, or principle or whatever you want to call it, strategic concept, uh, the uh, qualifiers, the reasons behind the principle when it works should be associated with the principle. And to do that, it takes a reason, but you need a framework to understand. And the examples need to be associated with the principle so that you can use reason as a comparison method. So uh, that said, so there seems to be a big debate going on. Uh, I think the debate is mostly finished, but some people think it's still going on um, between uh, Watson's rule independence and Agard's uh, strategic concepts thing. Also, I would like to disclaimer: I am not saying Watson's book is bad. I haven't I haven't reviewed it yet, but when I do, it's probably going to be five stars. It's a very influential book. It's very high quality. Okay, for the secrets of modern chess strategy. But okay, can you hop in and explain uh, rule independence and uh, Agard's competing theory? All right. So rule independence basically uh, was this thing that cropped up around 2000, uh, 2005, where uh, a lot of people noticed that the principles in the classics don't apply as much as they thought they would. They would apply, uh, they would try to apply principles in games and they would sometimes misapply it. And so they blame the principle. And okay, that might've been background information. What they, what people saw was computers are progressing faster than people. They're going to pass people. They calculate. Calculation is the main thing for them. Maybe it should be the main thing for us. Let's stop. Let's start ignoring generalizations and let's start calculating uh, everything. That's basic. Rule independence is is uh, calculation first. No general. Don't, don't worry too much about the generalizations. Some people like I think Watson gives some respect to it. Uh, Moon first thinks later gives no respect to it. But Deveretsky and Agard, the world's elite trainers, give a lot of respect to it and make it the foundation of their framework. And it's worked for the world's elite players who they've trained. Deveretsky is trained at one point, I believe, uh, about how, uh, trained, trained or directly worked with, according to Agard, half of the world's elite at some point. I'm talking about top 100. I mean, Agard's also doing this with the world's elite now. I mean, uh, and Agard as an adult improver who is stuck at um, low IM for a while, young adult, cr- got all the way up to 25, 50 ish V day and could have gone further if he didn't choose to be a trainer. I think we know that his method is effective. So, what is his contrasting theory? His contrasting theory is principles are not rules to be applied in games. They are a framework for understanding chess. And you don't always need to remember it for it to apply. And and so he explains this very well in Thinking Inside the Box. 
Before he knew how to explain this very well, in his book, Excelling at Chess, he would debate with Watson, and he confused things by talking about things in the context of rules, and Watson debated him, but really, Agard's point wasn't completely clear anyway, so uh, so it wasn't as clear as, uh, as it should be. Now, I think with thinking inside the box, things are very clear, and in my opinion, very clear about who's, who's, who's right. Now, I'm, I'm not going to say that Watson's wrong about calculation being important, and I'm not going to say that... Uh, I'm not going to like put words in his mouth and say for him that principles aren't important. I remember reading the rule independence section of his book, and my impression was he thought they're important. You just don't apply them during games, and they're so intuitive for top uh, for top GMs they don't worry about it. That is true for the most part, but from yeah, I agree. Uh, aside from that, he also implied there's too many qualifiers to keep track of. So let's focus on something else. My point is, you can keep track of them. I have been categorizing books this way. Agar has been categorizing books this way. You just need to be precise. It takes work. It's worth it. It's really, really effective for intuition improvement, especially for adults, because their subconscious isn't going to tell them what all the qualifiers are. And if you ignore the general, the inner generalizations of chess, and and then how are you supposed to get the information if your subconscious won't give it to you? It'll give you some, but not as much as before. And you don't consciously figure it out. You have to categorize this way. Okay, so I, I'm, this is why I gave one stars to move first, think later. This is very important for me and very and possibly the most important thing about how I approach chess books from the point of view of improving my chess, not counting calculation or thought process. So I greatly respect the classics. The classics are where they debated the generalizations. They discussed them. They discovered them. They started applying them, maybe misapplying them sometimes. They would become more and more nuanced. But they describe things from a general point of view. Uh, they would point out the, the weak color complex or the compensation for a pawn, not because of such and such variations, but because of uh, such and such general features. And this is true. Watson is also right that calculation is necessary. I think Lipnitsky's excellent book, Questions of Modern Chess Theory, a classic that Fisher supposedly learned Russian to read, clarifies this excellently. From critical positions to subtle positions. If a position is a critical position, you need calculation of forcing variations to get it to a position that you can evaluate generally. So great, now you calculate. But the, some positions are already settled. They can be evaluated without forcing moves to get you to a settled position. This is where principles come in. And principles are relevant there too, because sometimes the forcing variations will go according to the logical paths when there aren't direct tactics um, based on uh, the imbalances, which can be explained through principles and, or as Agard would put it, strategic concepts. So the classics give you the framework for the development of, of chess theory in regards to principles, generalizations, and strategic concepts. And nowadays, quite often at grandmaster level, it seems to be excessively complicated. And the reason why it's complicated is because somebody notices, oh, according to such and such strategic concept, we're trending toward a position where I will lose. Uh, there is such and such classic game that illustrates this. Whether they're consciously thinking about that or not is besides the point. They still learned it either intuitively through osmosis or consciously through uh, reason and analysis. So therefore, I will complicate the position through dynamics. And then it gets all crazy. Nobody knew what concept caused them to do that. But the older games allow you to see the a plan in action and then the opponent doesn't realize that with a normal trend of the game, without tactics, dynamics, whatever you want to call it, it will turn into, uh, it will, without, it, it, you'll eventually lose. So they just let the plan happen. Now we have an archetype. How do we, what are we aiming for when we have this imbalance? We're aiming for this. This is a web method of exploitation. We're trying to push it to simplicity so that there's no dynamics. We have this method for, for, uh, now we have an archetype to associate with a strategic concept. And this is one of the reasons why youth, I mean, under 18 years old, are very good at applying principles. They subconsciously associate the example with the principle and co and their subconscious figures out a lot of the qualifiers for them. Then when you're older, you need to figure out the qualifiers yourself sometimes or maybe have very precise narratives, um, which is important because narratives um, uh, can be... Um, narratives are a sort of anchor for association of plan storage from in your memory. Uh, David Malarn's looking into that. It's like an extra form of, of remembering, kind of like the Feynman method where if you can't explain something simple, you don't understand it well enough, but explaining it will help. Will help. So you need to be able to explain it and explaining it would relate to strategic concepts. And again, this is very important. A lot of books don't do this anymore. 
And this is a huge problem because unless you're super young with super good osmosis and the examples are like archetypical, how is that supposed to help you? You need some framework for understanding how this fits into the whole and how it could be applied. Maybe it'll help you understand the concept better. So I greatly respect classics, but I also greatly respect modern analytics that attempt to deconstruct a topic with words, but also, of course, you get variations too. Like, for example, many of the books by Quality Chess. There are, in my opinion the best publisher right now. I'm not going to say yeah. there are ba bad publishers. I, I buy from other publishers. I bought lots of books from other publishers, but quality chess is consistently good. For example, regarding the precise narratives and exact categorization for strategic concepts, Sam Shanklin's books are, uh, Sam Shanklin's books seem to be amazing. I haven't done the second one yet, but I'm about halfway or two thirds through the first one. Small steps, a giant improvement. It's fantastic. But you also have, it also makes sense to sort of follow the classics, not only follow, okay, I'm going to try to implement this in my game. Well, maybe not. Let's follow, let's understand the concept and look for application when we're studying. And then we could check the computer and compare or whatever. But um, let's see how they were trying to apply it and when something was more important. It's, it's very important to, to understand, to understand the, import, uh, the, the importance of strategic concepts. This is, this is foundational uh, to my approach to studying chess books, in my opinion. Uh, and of course, the debate me, some people have the right to dis disagree. And I think I made this clear from the discussion of chess computers. Disagree, please use reason. Don't don't just don't just accept what you what you've heard. L look for what seems to be what, what there's evidence for. Analyze it. Look and compare the uh, the perspectives and try to come up with what makes the most sense. And this makes the most sense for me and seems to be very effective for high-level chess improvement. So books that do that, books that have precise narratives of strategic concepts are very important for categorization. Classics are good for the development and modern analytics are good otherwise, but many authors don't know how to explain what they know. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is that they learned it mostly when they were very young. I'm talking about like kids, not just teenagers. And they didn't learn it from books. They just learned it from doing chess. And as a result they uh, didn't ever have to consciously understand it. They just absorbed it neurologically. Um, and so and so if they don't understand why they know what they know, they might just like, uh, they might explain it poorly. Those that learned it analytically, like uh, Jacob Agar, Mark Gavaretsky, uh, I've heard Mikhail Trishan's also a good author. Uh, Shanklin's a fantastic author. No surprise there. He's been working very hard and became grandmaster at the age of 19. That's very late for elite standards. No wonder he's a good teacher. He had to put a lot of analytic work in, no doubt. And he worked with Agard. Agard's methods work. Right. But so I think I think I think you get the idea. There's specific authors too. Uh, yeah, I th I think that's good. That's good advice overall. I mean, one thing I would say it's been a while since I read Secrets of Modern Chess History by Watson, but just, my, just my record strategy. Yeah, sorry, secrets. <laughs> I've said history because um, secrets of modern chess strategy. Because what I was going to say is, my recollection of that book is it's it's less a how to manual and more sort of a tracing the evolution. So um, I felt like the 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 quote unquote spat that uh, Agard had with him or the 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 fight. I mean, I loved Jakob Agard, but it did kind of feel to me like like he picked a fight with Watson. Um, is a uh, they they were talking about slightly different things because Agard's much more much more concerned about the the practical implications of how people can improve and how people should approach chess. Whereas I felt like Watson was saying like, um, you know, elite players used to do this, but now they do this um, sort of I, thing. I, I think I agree with you with that. So regarding Watson, I'm not again. I'm not saying Watson's book is bad. It's a great book. Not only that. Agard agrees that it's a great book. In a recent le group lesson on 365 Chess Academy, he called it a masterpiece, even though he disagrees with some things, and that it's an excellent best games collection of the last 10 years sort of thing. But um, I think the point is, even if this point was a small section of this book, that book infl that section of the book and the context of the other parts majorly influenced chess literature. Suba's book um, about... Dynamic um, chess strategy, or that's correct. Uh, that was a that was one written about the time. I think there was one by Yermolinsky about uh, chess improvement. Yeah, there was Road to Chess uh, Improvement. Yeah, yeah. There was a sequel by Watson. There was uh, th there was other books, and now you might notice Move First, Think Later, etc. It just changed how chess is discussed from the point of view of principles. It like it's like it's like the the um, the tipping point of a changing era, so to speak, and. And so it's discussed differently. And even if the theory he had uh, regarding it, it's not practical to categorize everything wasn't necessarily the most precise, everyone else starts discussing this concept. 
and everyone else starts debating this concept. And this concept is it's very important to understand how this works, I think. But no, I, I think Watson's book is great. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, well, Elijah, we've gotten so many great recommendations. Um, I just remembered during our interview that you had mentioned being up for a blindfold quiz um, oh, as we oh, finish sure. up. I totally, I have to admit, I forgot to, I wanted to do like a chess based deep dive and find like the, I wanted to find like the perfect miniature where there's only one winning move, but the game's not too long, but I've totally forgot. Although I do think I found something on my phone. So I believe I have a position where there's at, it's a short game and there's at minimum a best move at that made white resign uh, okay. on move on move 12. So, okay. um, one second, and, let, me flip the bo- let me flip the board real quick. Okay. Uh, so, okay. uh, uh, so listeners, I can see Elijah. He's covering his eyes now to have minimal distractions. Um, and okay, so here we go. It's a Budapest. Okay. Um, the game. I'll link to the game, but it's Laszlo Alfodi, 1933. Uh, so D4, uh-huh. knight, knight F6, C4, mm-hmm. E5, mm-hmm. D takes E5, Knight G4, mm-hmm. Queen D4, D6. E takes D6, Bishop takes D6. Let me know if you need me to stop or start over or anything. Uh, Knight F5. F3, castles, H3. Knight F3. Okay. Uh, knight, knight to C6, queen, okay. to e, queen to E4. Okay. Rook to E8, queen okay. to C2. Okay. Knight, knight to B4. Okay. Queen to C3. Okay. Knight to E3. Knight, Knight to, three. yeah, crazy move. Let me know if you want me to pause for a second. And listeners, you might need to replay this because I don't think we'll do it twice. Uh, let me know when you're ready, Elijah. Okay, I'm um, just recalibrating. Okay, go on. Okay, white plays knight to A3. Okay. Black plays knight on B to C2 check. Yeah. White plays knight takes c2. Okay. And now it is black to move. What is black's best move? Um, I think that knight takes c2 check, knight t- takes c2, bishop b4, check wins the queen or mates, right? You, yeah, you're on the right track. We, we Yeah, we already traded knights once. We, t- we took on c2 and they took back. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. I, I sorry. I mean, knight c two check, not knight takes c two. Knight takes c two. Knight. Uh, sorry. Uh, knight. Wait. Knight c. I mean, you you got it right. You just mentioned. Oh, sorry, the sorry, move. sorry, 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 sorry. The knights are already gone. Knight c two yeah. check. Queen takes queen takes c two. Uh, bishop b four check. And then queen c three is best. Uh, uh, queen d two is queen takes c two mate. So uh, queen c three. Bishop takes c three. Uh, wins the queen. Right. Well, if you do knight takes c two check, queen takes bishop b four. White would have knight d two. Oh wait. Oh yeah. So oh that knight. So, sorry. So you've got the right tactical theme, but the wrong classic move order issue. Oh, oh wait, the oh, the knights. Go, oh, the knights gone. No wonder I said knight c two first. Uh, sorry. <laughs> then it's then it's going to be bishop b four, and then after queen takes b four, uh, b four, the knight c two check wins the queen. Oh, that's uh, actually is that mate. That might be mate. Very good. Ding ding ding. And if knight takes b four after bishop b four. If knight takes b four after bishop b four, I think that um, is queen d one mate. Okay, correct. Good job, Elijah. Um, so yeah, listeners, <laughs> um, just to show he's been doing some blindfold training as well. Um, so Elijah, uh, awesome stuff. Um, I think people know they can find you on Chessable. Um, what else is the best way to keep up with uh, all your projects? And I'm sure, I mean, there's, again, I think, I feel like people might need to listen to this more than once um, to, to catch all the, the knowledge that you shared. So if they have any follow-up questions, is there a preferred uh, uh, platform for that? Sure. You can message me on chess.com. Okay. Also, uh, I think I forgot to say this earlier. I don't remember. But with Puzzle Rush, I'm doing a lot of Puzzle Rush because it helps me improve my visualization speed. And I've noticed that I can do, I can calculate more easily when I do a lot of it. And that with one hour a day, I don't get the same impact. With two hours a day, there seems to be some sort of temporary gains that compound. I'm, my blindfolds in improving, uh, I can do Agard stepping stones methods. Uh, now, I'm not saying that I can necessarily play uh, blindfold blitz well, although I've been winning mostly against a, a play uh, against a 17, 1800 friend of mine. 
Uh, I've one of the things I've been I, I tried it for Deferetsi's analytic manual with blindfold uh, slow puzzle solving. I don't think I could have done many of those things without a lot of speed tactics consistently. There seems to be some sort of tipping point that makes it easier specifically for adults to move pieces around in their head. That's what David told me. I tested it. It seems to be working for me. <laughs> it's possibly my number one priority right now. So, huh. and are you going to, are you going to hit some tournaments when, uh, when, when we're allowed to? Oh, of, uh, of course. I mean, I, I already, I had to, like, I, I registered for like four norm tournaments this year and they got canceled. But I'm I'm already like I might go to the a friend of mine's already looking into tournaments and uh, for example I might go to the Washington International in a couple months I'm not sure yet but I'm believe me I'm looking forward to tournaments yeah I bet I have all that hard work you got to put it to use and I forgot to mention I think you won the under twenty two hundred at the World Open right uh no I was one round I was playing under two thousand uh, a couple of years ago and uh, I was one round away from winning or time time for second instead I lost the last round and. Uh, did, I got like fifth or something. Okay. Uh, so sorry if I brought up a sore subject, but does that mean that you're eligible to win under 2200? I mean, so you're, you're right now, I think 2186. Are you? Are oh, you yeah. Gonna... Oh, oh yeah. I did. I did. I did crash due to some concentration issues after the fact, but I'm, I'm working on that. Um, I wait, is that even, I, I was, hmm. I think I was going to play in that tournament. I don't remember which. I think I was going to play in the open section actually. Okay. But Cause maybe, I'm just curious. But, yeah. I would not want to play you in an under 2200 section, but but I mean, the money can be enticing, I'm sure. So, uh, yeah, I haven't. I mean, I, I registered for Open, but it got canceled. I was gonna do it with my brother. He's 1100 USCF. He was gonna play a. He was gonna play like under 1300. But yeah, I don't want to play. I don't want to play him either. He got 2900 <laughs> on the tactics trainer, and now yeah, we're teaching exactly. positional chess. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, Elijah, this has been a lot of fun. Um, uh, I wish you con- continued success. It'll be interesting. I look forward to seeing how you continue to improve over the years. I feel like you're you're an excellent guinea pig, and I really appreciate your sharing uh, all your experiences with uh, with with myself and with our listeners. Oh, I'm, I'm glad that you found it to be helpful. Okay. Have a good day, Elijah. You too. Bye. Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, and thanks to those who continue to help spread the word about Perpetual Chess. Positive reviews on podcast platforms and YouTube help people discover the show, as does telling a friend or sharing it on social media. Speaking of which, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Beneficial1, or join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group and continue the conversation about the latest interview. But most of all, of course, I want to thank those who provide financial support to the show, especially right now with so much disruption going on in the world. Most of all, I want to thank Chessable for sponsoring the show and to everyone who kicks in via PayPal or the Perpetual Chess Patreon page to help sustain and improve Perpetual Chess. And without further ado, I would like to give special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, Apprentice Chess Twitch Channel, Andrew Alharjri, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Chris Flanagan, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Driver, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natal, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, James Kennedy, Jen Scream, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, Lucio Casada Silva, the law officers of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Moonmaster9000, you recently stopped your pledge, but Perpetual Chess will always love you. The famous Mr. Dodgy, Peter Zhodi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan of Strong Chess, Todd Kennedy, and I also would like to thank the following people. Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Anidi Deer, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Malin, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of U.S. Chess, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Blaskacek, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Daylin Shelton, Dirk Decker, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ethan Smith, Ian Mason, I am elect Donnie Ariel, or possible not I am elect, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letarte Lavoie, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barter, Giovanni Russo, Greg Harfst, Han Schutt, 
Harish Srinivasan, Jacob Kovach, Jacques Pari, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Murr, Jason Woolham, J.D. Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Holland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, J.J. Schnod, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joe Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katerina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Kapalakrishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Ryforth, Laura Beljowski, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspidi, Mike Clem, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Salin, Neil Bruce, Negmat Malajanov, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal, Charbonneau, Posse Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randall Temple, Ricky Grahava, Richard Hollenbuck, Robert Turner, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwalder, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, Wayne Beam, William Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone. Catch you guys soon. Music.